I invite you this evening to turn in your Bibles to the book of Daniel. As we continue our 66 books series, we have the really tragic experiment of condensing such a wonderful, magnificent book as Daniel into 50 minutes. I would commend to you the verse-by-verse exposition that we did through the book of Daniel uh, to get it in all of its details and its glory. My hope tonight really is just to whet your appetite to read the book of Daniel for the rest of your life, to make it a course of regular study, to make it a a part of your normal rhythm of meditation, uh, to make it a part of what you go to for comfort. What we find in the book of Daniel is tremendous help in times of tumult. We think that we live now in volatile times, geopolitics in the balance, uh, the future uncertain. The book of Daniel is for us. In fact, when the Bible was being translated for the Lisu tribe in Thailand, the portions of the Bible had come into their language already via missionaries, and they were being oppressed by the Marxists in Southeast Asia. And the Bible translators, the missionaries there, were in the process of putting Genesis verse to verse in their language, but they had heard some of the teachings from the book of Daniel, and the people from the Lisu tribe said, finish Genesis later, give us Daniel now. They recognized the importance of what it means to take comfort in the sovereignty of God when the saints suffer under sinful tyranny, under uncertain times. Calvin, John Calvin wrote a thousand page commentary in the book of Daniel, and he dedicated it to the Protestants in France. He had left there 26 years earlier. Uh, In 1561, he wrote the commentary or dedicated the commentary uh, on on Daniel from Geneva to those French Protestants. He had been away 26 years. He had escaped uh, from the, the tyranny of the Catholic Church that was literally killing all of the Protestants, that was telling the, the populace in France at the time, you can have their stuff if you rat them out. And so Protestants fled. In the 1550s, uh, Geneva became a, a refuge for French Protestants fleeing the tyranny. They came to Geneva, were trained. In one season, nearly 100 men were trained as pastors to go from Geneva back in to the lion's den, as it were, in France. Not a single one of them survived. They were all martyred. And so Calvin dedicated his commentary on Daniel to the the Protestants still in French. He says, I have no desire to return to France, but I cannot forget you, and you need the book of Daniel for encouragement. He wrote this, Here then we observe as in a living picture that when God spares and even indulges the wicked for a time, He proves his servants like gold and silver. So we ought not consider it a grievance to be thrown into the furnace of trial when profane men enjoy the calmness of repose. Those are sobering words to people suffering. Don't worry about the fact that the bad guys are in control and things seem to be going well when it may cost you your very lives. That was Calvin's comfort. Calvin knew that the book of Daniel would be a comfort to those whose wives were ravished, their children were murdered, their homes were plundered. He said, in fact, in that uh, opening to the book of Daniel, more atrocious things may yet be at hand. In fact, 11 years later was St. Bartholomew's Massacre, August 24th, 1572. And just put a footnote on there, look it up on Wikipedia, read about it. Um, Just a devastating period in history for those who believe the gospel. The book of Daniel has been a a ready help to God's people from the time it was written even to our day. Let's talk about the author for a moment. Our outline will just sort of peruse some hooks to hang the data of Daniel on. Uh, The author is Daniel. His name means God is judge or God is my judge. It's spelled two different ways in the book, uh, and one of them has an extra little letter. Uh, and, And it's significant for a man who knows that God is judge over everyone that one can rest, that no matter how bad it looks now, the end of all things is in the hand of a sovereign God who assesses every single heart, holds everyone to account, and work out all of the universe unto his right course. 
It's also helpful to think of Daniel and his own name, meaning God is my judge. That is the sovereignty of God, axiomatically, universally, boiled down to his personal life. I don't know about you, uh, do you see God as your judge, your assessor? He, he will be, he's the assessor of all, but, but if you see God as your judge, personally, in other words, if you fear the Lord, then you have no need to fear any man. You have no need to fear any circumstance. You have no need to fear any government, any tyranny, any change of empires, any new administration. Daniel was that man. Daniel was a noble in the house of Israel, in Judah, in Jerusalem, uh, perhaps even of the royal line. He was taken captive in his teens. Uh, We'll sort of round this out to about 15 years old. And can you imagine being taken from your home and transported 500 miles away as the crow flies to a land that was a land of your nation's enemies? Think at 15 years old, the the bad guys come and destroy your homeland and lay siege to your city and your country and take you away to, say, North Korea. Or pick your bad guy country in the world today. And Daniel never returned home. From 15 years old into his mid-80s, he never saw his homeland again. It's interesting when Daniel prays, he opened his window and prayed in the direction of Jerusalem. Hope, anticipation, that wasn't some superstition. He just knew that was the location geographically of God's promises that Daniel clung to. Three-year education in Babylon. Daniel had abilities, divine enablement, faith, prayer, courage. He was a prophet. Uh, Jesus calls Daniel a prophet, but he wasn't a prophet in maybe the the normal sense of the word, walking around in weird clothes and saying, thus saith the Lord, here's a proclamation. Daniel was more a statesman. He was something like the prime minister at times in several administrations, even several empires. He administered in the Babylonian Empire, the Medo-Persian Empire, the Greek Empire. And his prophecy was not in proclamation, but in the receiving of visions. And as an administrator in a pagan regime, he received direct revelation from God in visions, in the dreams of pagan kings, the interpretations of dreams. He was spoken to by angels. He was even addressed a couple of times by the pre-incarnate Christ. And God directed him to write. And he wrote down what God told him to write. And all that we know of Daniel's early life comes from the book of Daniel. We learn some other things about Daniel elsewhere in Scripture. Ezekiel tells us that Daniel was a man of eminent righteousness before the Lord his God. Uh, Ezekiel also tells us that Daniel was extremely wise. Jesus encourages us to read the prophet Daniel and pay attention to the details of his prophecies. And the author to Hebrews refers to Daniel most likely when he says, and some shut the mouths of lions. But most of what we know about Daniel comes from the book itself. He was respected by Ezekiel, who was a a contemporary of Daniel, a priest and a prophet to the exiles. He was called highly esteemed by the angel Gabriel. Uh, He was a prophet getting direct revelation from the Lord. In fact, the Jewish historian Josephus calls him one of the greatest prophets. Daniel was highly esteemed in Jewish lore and history. Now, Daniel has been maligned since then because Daniel's future prophetic sections are so accurate in their details of history that has already passed that people who don't believe in the Bible, people who deny the supernatural, people who deny prophecy, will actually say some guy made up this character of Daniel and wrote about the facts after they happened. That's how accurate his prophecies, particularly of intertestamental period, are. I have up on the screen there Daniel's age. In Daniel 1, uh, probably 15 years old, at the deportation in 605. That was a deportation of some nobles from the noble family uh, unto Babylon. In Daniel 2, he's probably 17, 18 years old uh, at Nebuchadnezzar's uh, statue vision that Daniel interprets, probably 603 BC. In Daniel 4, he's probably 47 to 48 years old. That's Nebuchadnezzar's tree dream. The four beast vision occurs in 553 BC. Daniel at that point in Daniel 7 is probably 64 years old. He's probably 66 years old in Daniel 8 with the ram and goat vision. 
and he's probably 80 years old when Belshazzar takes the throne, 539. Uh, Belshazzar's feast is detailed there, and Belshazzar loses the throne. Uh, That's Daniel 5. Daniel's probably 80 years old at that point. That puts Daniel in the lion's den at, at somewhere around the age of 80 to 83. I don't know about you, my impression was, and here's a photograph, by the way, I don't know who got that. That's before the age of ectochrome slide film or anything like that. Um, no, that's, you know, that's a painting. Um, but that's a good painting because Daniel's in his 80s depicted in that picture. I always just had this impression that Daniel was like a kid and there's these lions. Um, but if you follow the chronology, he's probably in his 80s at that point. Daniel 9 and 11, Daniel is probably 81 years old when he prays for the nation and he receives the answer to that prayer in the 77s, around 539 B.C. And then under Cyrus, uh, he is 83 and older. So Daniel is an old man. He ends up living out his years in Persia. He never goes back to Jerusalem. He doesn't go back to his homeland, although he will. And we'll talk about it at the end of our evening tonight. What is the setting of the book of Daniel. Uh, Jeremiah 21 and 22, we won't read it this evening, sets the stage for us and helps us understand the deportation. Uh, There are three deportations uh, of Jerusalem into Babylon. Daniel, as one of the nobles, is taken away in the first wave. And it's interesting, Jeremiah the prophet was given a message from God that if, and we looked at this a couple weeks ago uh, when Bobby preached through Jeremiah, that if the people would obey Yahweh and understand that Babylonian captivity was part of God's good plan, not only to judge Israel, but also to preserve and rescue Israel for the long term, they should trust Yahweh and go to Babylon. And of course, those who did not believe God's word through Jeremiah resisted You remember King Zedekiah resisted, tried to go out the back door, uh, busted a hole in the wall, and then got his eyes plucked out while his kids were murdered in front of him. And everybody that didn't follow the direction of the Lord to actually go into Babylonian captivity and trust him ended up suffering either in the land or in Egypt or wherever they tried to flee. But Daniel was one of those nobles who was absconded early on in the first deportation and then lived a reasonably comfortable life. In fact, Jeremiah tells the exiles in Babylon, live there, build homes for yourselves, build gardens. That means you're going to plant things in the ground and actually eat of their fruit. And then pray for that nation and it will go well for you. And you remember the famous line in Jeremiah 29, 11, after the 70 years are done, he'll bring you back because I know the plans I have for you, declares Yahweh. On Yahweh's word, the Babylonian captivity would simultaneously be judgment for sin, idolatry, and rebellion, and a failure to keep Sabbath for the land, and a preservation of God's covenant commitments to his beloved nation. Really amazing thing. Like most of the Old Testament prophets, judgment and salvation, both together converging in the future history of the nation of Israel. So that's the setting. That's why Daniel's there in Babylon, because Israel disobeyed. You had basically 400 years since David was king over United Monarchy, and things have just not gone well. I have some dates for you up on the screen. 1010 to 970 BC, David was king over the United uh, Nation of Israel, and then Solomon followed him. In 966, Solomon dedicated the temple in Jerusalem. And when you think about this, this was the golden era of Israel's history. Uh, Saul, David, Solomon are the only three kings that reign over the united monarchy of the northern tribes, the southern tribes, before the split. And the government of God was located on the earth. You have the the temple uh, of Solomon, which replicated the tabernacle in the wilderness where God would actually dwell with all of his glory. You had the functioning sacrificial system so that people in their filthiness could actually approach a holy God and not be incinerated. You had Israel in the land, even at the dedication of the temple in, um, in Solomon's day, he is praying that Israel will fulfill its mission. That is, they will be a, a unique people, a pure people, that they will be set apart in what they eat, how they work, what they wear, and the nations will look in and say, wow, they worship Yahweh, the God of the heavens, the God of the entire universe, the God of all peoples everywhere, has set his affections on this people. Let's go meet with Israel's God. Right, that was the high point, 1 Kings 8. Three chapters later, we find out Solomon has made political alliances, married foreign women, and building altars to demons in their honor. 
just three chapters later. And for David's sake, the kingdom didn't split in Solomon's day, but it split after Solomon. And from that point forward, you've got 10 tribes in the north, two tribes in the south, a divided nation, and a downward spiral. No good kings in the northern tribes. No, no one faithful to Yahweh. A handful in the south. In fact, the last four kings before Daniel's day were all wicked. You have the fall of the northern kingdom in 722 B.C. when Samaria fell to Assyria and the Assyrian Empire was uh, the, the world power at the time. Jeremiah prophesied 626 to 585. And then Nineveh fell to the armies of the three allies. Nineveh is the capital of Assyria. So they're the world empire, they're top dog, and then that empire falls. And, and the three allies involved in the fall of the Assyrian Empire with the capital of Nineveh are the Babylonians, the Medes, and the Scythians. In 609, good king, the last good king of Judah, Josiah, was killed by Pharaoh Necho at the Battle of Megiddo. And that leads to a, just a crushing downfall in the overturn of administrations in the rulership of Judah. But it also leads to uh, the rise of uh, the Egyptians who were vying for power in the Middle East, which then led to 605, the Battle of Carchemish, where battle, uh, Babylon beat Egypt. And the general in charge of the Babylonian victory over the, the, the mighty nation of Egypt was none other than Nebuchadnezzar. And so Nebuchadnezzar's victory as a general led to the rise of the Babylonian Empire. Now they are the new world power taking over all the territories of the previous empires. And that was in 605, the same year Daniel and his three friends were deported to Babylon. Imagine that just for a moment from Daniel's perspective. You're, you're watching the scene. You're seeing the geopolitics shift. And you go, which way is it going to go? Who's going to win? Who's going to be in charge? Are we going to be speaking Egyptian? Are we going to be speaking Babylonian? Uh, what are we going to be speaking? Chaldean? Aramaic? What, how is this going to go? And then to see empires just fall. And you think all of the strength, all the military might, all of the money, all of the sacrifice, and then all of the people trampled under all of these empires as kings vie for power with one another and everybody gets caught in the middle. Where would your heart be? How would your heart sink when you were told, ooh, the new evil empire, and you're going off to that capital. That's where you're gonna be. A land of pagan gods and idolatry. In one sense, it's a very real answer to the idolatrous heart of the nation of Israel. We're jealous of the other nations and everything that they have. We, we like their gods. We're going to bring their altars into our land. And God says, you want their gods? I'm going to give you their gods. I'm going to put you in their lands. The northern tribes first to Assyria. The southern tribes last to Babylon. Second deportation, 597 B.C. Uh, 10,000 captives taken to Babylon in that, that point. That is when Nebuchadnezzar subjugated Jerusalem, uh, kind of put his uh, authority around it and said, uh, no more rebellions over there, I'm just taking the whole place over. 587 B.C. was the final fall of the southern kingdom with Jerusalem destroyed and the third deportation. So Daniel was in Babylon eight years before the second deportation, 19 years before the third deportation. So Daniel in the first deportation sort of becomes a veteran for other exiles who end up in Babylon. He went there as a young man. You know the story. He was faithful, trusted the Lord, um, but he did so in a volatile situation in an unknown land. And think about all of his Bible knowledge up to 15 years old had to fuel his faithful life into his mid-80s. So it's too bad our students are over there. I would deliver just sort of a sidebar sermon about how well you need to know the Word of God right now because you don't know what's coming. Okay, the rest of us over those hills, uh, we can listen to that, I suppose. You've got to know the Bible. In the book of Daniel, you end up with a change of empires. from In Daniel's day, from the Babylonians to the Medians to the Persians, and then after Daniel's day to the Greeks, to the Romans, and then the book of Daniel covers all the huge swath of the rest of human history to the revived Roman Empire, which is still future to our day, and then the last kingdom we'll talk about. What is the purpose of the book of Daniel? Well, it's not a biography. This isn't really about Daniel. Um, it, it's not a biography of his friends, although it details a, a handful of stories about them. This isn't even a story about the exile. It does not give us a chronological uh, expose on the exile into Babylon. 
This book's purpose is the glorious self-disclosure of the sovereign God of the universe. What is the purpose of Daniel? God, through his prophet Daniel, wants to put himself on display as the one who is meticulously sovereign over all things, who is operating all of history and bringing all of history unto his one glorious end, that he will have a king on the earth that will demolish all previous human rulership. That's where all of this is going. And it's a scary path, frankly. It comes through trial and persecution and upheavals, changes of empires, wars, and all the catastrophe that war brings. But the message of this self-disclosure of the sovereign God of the universe to Israel has this purpose. At a very low moment in their history, there is hope, but not soon. And there are covenant promises that God will keep. And his kingdom will come, but not yet. There is no imminency to the hopeful message to Israel. In fact, just the opposite. The message to Israel during the Babylonian captivity is, yep, Jeremiah said you're going to go back after 70 years, but you're not going to be sovereign. You're not going to own the land. You're not going to be in control. You will not even own the clothes that the priests will wear much less have control of the temple precincts and the sacrifices. All of that will be under the thumb of pagan empires. The Persians, the Greeks, then the Romans, and then you'll have nothing for a large gap in time. That's a lot of bad news. The hope for Israel is deferred for a long time to come. Could you imagine getting a message that, hey, everything's going to turn out all right? After you and your children and your grandchildren and your grandchildren and their grandchildren and their great, 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 great grandchildren suffer a whole lot and the world gets really bad and ugly. That's the message of Daniel to Israel. God is in charge, and it is a book of hope. It is a book of the finality of God's victory through his Messiah. And yet, dark times are coming. To the Gentile nations, the purpose of God's glorious self-disclosure as the sovereign God of the universe is simply this. The God of Israel is the only God. The God of Israel is the only God. And He is in charge. And His kingdom will come. And it may seem, Babylon, that you have a golden age. It won't last. And then when the Medes beat up on the Babylonians... A takeover in one night, 539 B.C. That won't last. And, and the Persians, as, as the, the Medo-Persian Empire is kind of uh, two horns on one ram, kind of blends one into the other, uh, the, the Persians will fall away. And then you'll have Alexander the Great just take over the world and establish the Grecian Empire. And you think, well, this is the sea change that changes everything. When will the Greeks ever fall? And then the Romans will come. And in all of that time, Israel is in the crosshairs of all of those wars between empires. In fact, it's really striking to think that from the time of, the, of Alexander the Great forward, Israel was not allowed to put lawful Levitical priests over the sacrificial system. The, the priests that operated in the sacrificial system in the time of Christ were not of the Levitical line. They were actually a violation of Mosaic law. They were the ones who were in league politically with their overlords, first the Greeks, then the Romans. Which is why when you get to the time of Christ, the the religious situation of the day is so corrupt. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the the power brokers in uh, in Israel in Jesus' time, They were not the sincere, we want to follow Mosaic law type, even though they said, you have to follow rules. They added a bunch. They really wanted to keep their power. And the setup for all of that is this period of Israel's history where they are back in the land, but not sovereign, not even able to follow Mosaic law. And what we call the the period of time from the first deportation, I think that's really where it starts, when when Daniel and the few nobles are taken to Babylon and, and Nebuchadnezzar begins the Babylonian tyranny over Jerusalem, ending Israeli sovereignty in the land. This is the period called the times of the Gentiles. And we're still in it. 
and we will be in it until God is finished with the times of the Gentiles. Let me give you the theme of the book of Daniel. This comes from J.I. Packer's Knowing God. And um, I wouldn't have known to look for this as a great summary of Daniel. It's not on my list of Daniel commentaries. But I read this years ago and I tucked it away and it it, uh, has stood the test of time. I'll just read it to you at length. In the face of the night and splendor of the Babylonian Empire, which had swallowed up Palestine and the prospect of further great empires to follow, dwarfing Israel by every standard of human calculation, the book as a whole forms a dramatic reminder that the God of Israel is King of kings and Lord of lords, that heaven rules, that God's hand is on history at every point, that history indeed is no more than His story, the unfolding of His eternal plan, and that the kingdom which will triumph in the end is God's kingdom. That's a great mouthful summary of the book of Daniel. God's in charge. And the message to Israel is, His kingdom is coming. And the message to the Gentile world is, His kingdom is coming. Let's talk about the structure for just a moment. There are several ways that people have broken down the book of Daniel. You might think of chapters 1 to 6 as Daniel and his friends, chapters 7 to 12 as the future. Um, That's roughly true. I think a better breakdown is a breakdown along language lines. Chapter 1 is written in Hebrew. Chapters 2 through 7 are written in Aramaic. And then 8 to the end of the book are back in Hebrew. So you have this Hebrew-Aramaic sandwich. And it tells a story, just the, way, just the way the language is written. In fact, Aramaic was the lingua franca of the political world in the Middle East during this time. That is, the language that the courts of the empires spoke. It was the language you had to speak if you were going to work in the realm of diplomacy and, and foreign uh, activity. So, the fact that the opening chapter, the introduction is in Hebrew... It is the scene where Israel is delivered over to the Gentile world. Look at Daniel chapter 1 and just how the stage is set for this book. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah. Okay, good. We're Israel, Judah, kings. Things, that's great. Uh, we, we have years of their reigns. Wonderful. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And then a shocking statement in verse 2. Do you see it? The Lord gave, the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into Nebuchadnezzar's hand, along with the vessels in the house of God. And Nebuchadnezzar brought them to the land of Shinar. You know where the land of Shinar is? Think back to Genesis 11 and the Tower of Babel. You mean the the, the very geographical place that is the forever emblem of man's atrocious, audacious pride against the God of heaven? Denying God's commands, refusing to obey Him and saying, we're going to do this our way and we're going to build this thing. God had to come down to the plain of Shinar and smash it and hear this new rising rebellious empire in the same plot of ground. And what has Nebuchadnezzar done? Taken off the nobility, the line of Judah. We've already been tracing through the Old Testament the the promises to the house of David from which Messiah would come. And here this pagan empire is dragging them off to Shinar? To the capital of the, the dark empire? This is a staggering scene. And so you have basically Hebrew ending in chapter 1. God's dealings with Israel is as God is actually delivering Israel, gave them over to Babylon. God gave his people up into captivity. And so the Hebrew language ends after chapter 1. In chapters 2 through 7, you have Aramaic. This is the the language of the pagans, the language of the Gentiles, the language of the, the overlords and the empires. And now Israel is in foreign territory. And so what happens is in a foreign language. And the, the, the encroachment of this language is so interesting because even the Aramaic alphabet became the alphabet through which we read the Hebrew language. Now, you, you read a Hebrew Bible and we say, oh yeah, I read Hebrew. You're actually reading Aramaic script. This is the period where Aramaic took over as the letters used even with Hebrew words. 
So the old Hebrew script is now totally gone. Nobody reads that anymore. We're reading actually Aramaic script. This is a lasting emblem of the judgment of God against his people for their rebellion. And so two through seven ends up in this interesting pattern. Oh no, my pattern broke. Oh, that's weird. Okay. I put some weird spaces in there. It didn't format right. We can talk it through. Chapters two and seven should be all the way out at the same level. Uh, Chapters three and six should be at the same level. I guess they kind of are. And then four and five in the same level. If you were to quipping hour this morning, you heard Chaz Morris use a big fancy word called chiasm. That's a, a Hebrew poetry feature that narrows your focus in on something where you have two Uh, identical or uh, synonymous ideas on the outside, and then inside that, two ideas that sort of rhyme ideas with each other, and inside that, two ideas that rhyme inside of each other. And the function of all of that, like like a laser beam, is to narrow our focus into the middle. The the author's point in a chiasm uh, is to draw our attention to what's in the center. So look what's on the outside. Chapter two, chapter four are both visions about four kingdoms. Same four kingdoms. Chapter two is Nebuchadnezzar's statue dream. Uh, Chapter seven is the four beast vision. And both of those visions depict the Babylonian, followed by the Medo-Persian, followed by the Greek, followed by the Roman empires. And so those same two visions, two different pictures. Oh, thank you. That was wonderful. We can breathe easy. Um, And so uh, chapter two, chapter seven, the the statue vision and the four beast vision, uh, both portraying the same thing. Now go inside of that. We're going to narrow our focus to God delivering his people, specifically the the Jewish exiles, from Gentile persecution. Uh, Do you remember the fire? And Mishael, Azariah, oh, I want to say Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. Their real names are better, uh, whatever they are. We'll go with Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. They're in the fire, and God delivers them. And then in chapter 6, you have God delivering his people again from Gentile persecution. This time, it's Daniel in the lion's den. And so those two ideas are parallel. And that, again, is drawing our attention farther into the center. And what's in the center? God humbles a Gentile king in chapter 4. The Gentile king humbled there is Nebuchadnezzar. And in chapter 5, God humbles another Gentile king. That's Belshazzar. And they're similar in that both of these are kings over world empires and nobody tells them what to do. And they were proud of that. Nebuchadnezzar said, look what I built with my own hand. What God is there that can deliver from my, you know, ooh, ah, Nebuchadnezzar, don't say that. <laughs> Belshazzar, boasting. And you remember the handwriting on the wall ends his empire in one night, 539 BC. The difference between the two, interestingly, is that Nebuchadnezzar is humbled through repentance and then he gives glory to God in doxology and praise. We'll read some of those statements. Belshazzar just dies. And what's interesting about this Aramaic section, this Gentile section, we're going to take a time out from Hebrew, we're going to go to the language of the pagan nations, and God's going to deliver a message to the Gentile world, to every king who thinks he's sovereign, every king who thinks he's in control, everybody who has the world by its tail. And God says, I'm going to humble you. And God will have his day. Jesus Christ will be Lord. The Messiah will, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he indeed is Lord. And everyone will confess that he's Lord, enemies and friends alike. And the proud will be humbled either by repentance and faith or by just demolition, destruction, and eternal judgment. And those two kings right at the center of this Gentile section uh, just narrow our focus for what is God doing While he's got Israel out of the land in the Gentile world, he's actually brought his people, the recipients of covenant promises, who carry his name into the foreign land. He's bringing them into that foreign land, and he's saying something to the foreign nations. So that all the rest of the world now can read Daniel 2 through 7 and see what's coming. Every president, every emperor, every tyrant, every mid-level bureaucrat, can understand that a kingdom is coming 
made not by human hands. It is coming from heaven and it's coming like a great ball to smash Nebuchadnezzar's four kingdom statue. It's coming to end and destroy the, the four beasts of the coming world kingdoms. And that kingdom will have no end. That is God's message to the Gentile world, to the nations. And he does it in their language. We come back in chapter 8 to 12, and while it details the futures of, of empires and rulers that come and go, get them off the scene and on the scene, and, and for anybody who lived during the eras of those, it would seem like a long time. And yet in God's economy, they just rattle off quickly. All of that's back in Hebrew because all of those histories of future nations from the intertestamental period and then over a large span of time to the, 70 week, the 70th week of Daniel, the revived Roman Empire and the last human, uh, sinfully human government. All of that involves Israel. Uh, from the time of the, the, the Greeks up to the Romans at the time of Christ, then a space, then the revived Romans at the end of the age, all of that involves Israel. And so it's written in Hebrew. You see, the, the language differentiation actually tells you what's going on in the book. It's a great way to understand the structure. Let's talk about some of the major ideas in the book of Daniel we need to cover in the next 16 minutes. The sovereignty of God. This is an important message in the book. And just look down at verse 2 of the first chapter. The Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. Look down at verse 9. God gave Daniel favor. Look down at verse 17. God gave these four youths knowledge and intelligence in every branch of literature and wisdom. Look down at verse 20 of chapter 2. Let the name of God be blessed forever and ever, for wisdom and power belong to him. It is he who changes times and epochs. He removes kings and establishes kings. He gives wisdom to wise men and knowledge to men of understanding. It is he who reveals profound and hidden things. Verse 23, Daniel says, You have given me wisdom. You have made known to me what we requested. You have made known the king's matter. Verse 28, God is the one who reveals mysteries. Verse 29, God reveals mysteries. He has made known to you, Nebuchadnezzar, what will take place in the end times. Verse 37 of chapter 2, the God of heaven has given kingdom, power, and strength, and glory to Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, and then verse 38, he has given them into your hand and has caused you to rule. Listen, who's in charge of whose president? Who's in charge of who's the dark lord of some evil empire on the earth? God is. He is sovereign. He's sovereign in the macro, in the big picture, and he is sovereign meticulously in the details. One more, look at chapter 5 and verse 19. Because of the grandeur which God bestowed on him, all the peoples, nations, men of every language feared and trembled. Listen, when, when things happen on the geopolitical level, Who's back of it? Who's behind it? Who is orchestrating it? Who is the author of all history? The God of Israel. If you were a pagan king in the ancient Near East and just trouncing over Palestine, taking whatever you want out of the temple, uh, taking people captive, laying siege to the city, demolishing the walls, raising it to the ground, leaving it an ash heap, you'd think you were in charge. That leads us to the next significant message here, and it's pride. It's pride. God humbles the proud. That, that is what the section about the Gentiles centers in on, the, the pride particularly of Nebuchadnezzar, and then uh, the pride of a king who would not repent. Dr. George Zemeck calls it the amnesia of pride. Look at chapter 2, verse 47. After getting an interpretation of the statue dream, Nebuchadnezzar says to Daniel, Surely your God is a God of gods and a Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries, since you have been able to reveal this mystery. The king promoted Daniel, gave him many gifts. Turn to 315. He 
He says, if you're ready, at the moment you hear the sound of the instruments, fall down and worship the image that I've made. The image that you've made? What what did Nebuchadnezzar do after hearing about the, the statue dream that he had? Daniel told him what God was doing with the statue. He's actually portraying uh, the events of human history until the end of time. Daniel says, hmm, statue, gold. I am the head of gold. Let's make a whole statue of gold all about me and make the whole nation bow down to it. When you hear the music, go. That was the wrong application. If you're looking for what not to do with a Bible, that's it. Uh, this is the amnesia of pride. Wait, Daniel's God is the God of gods and the God, Lord over all kings. I know what I'll do. I'll declare myself to be the head cheese. I'll have everybody worship me. He had already forgotten. Look at chapter 4, verse 3. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Azariah, Mishael, and Hananiah. Hananiah, thank you. They come out of the fire. And then Nebuchadnezzar says, verse 3 of chapter 4, How great are his signs, how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion is from generation to generation. Here's the king of the world superpower saying, there's somebody bigger than me. He's giving glory to God. And then look at the amnesia in verse 30. Walking on the roof of his royal palace, the king reflected and says, Is this not Babylon the great, which I myself have built as a royal residence by my might, my power, and for the glory of my majesty? And you're just saying, oh, Nebuchadnezzar, don't say such things. While the word was in his mouth, a voice came from heaven saying, King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is declared, sovereignty has been removed from you. And you have to think, what kind of sovereignty is it if it can be taken away? Who's truly king? And his amnesia of pride struck again. God humbles him kindly. I mean, God is so patient with Nebuchadnezzar. Turns him into a beast, walks around in the grass. And then eventually, his story ends with giving glory to God. Look at verse 37. After being humbled to the dust and then uh, coming to his senses, he says, I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise, exalt, and honor the king of heaven, for all his works are true, his ways are just, and he is able to humble those who walk in pride. That is autobiographical. And his story ends. We don't get a uh, death and he laid with his fathers or he, he uh, was smote by his enemies or anything like that. That's just the end. Nebuchadnezzar's story ends in humility before the God of the universe before the God of Israel. Next verse, Belshazzar the king, and four administrations have gone on in between. He held a great feast for a thousand of his nobles, was drinking wine in the presence of the thousand. He tasted the wine. He gave orders to bring the gold and silver vessels which Nebuchadnezzar his father or his predecessor had taken out of the temple. And they brought the gold vessels that had been taken out of the temple, the house of God, and they were drinking with them. This is a drunken, immoral revelry with the precious vessels out of the temple of God in Jerusalem. This is audacious pride. He hasn't remembered the story of Nebuchadnezzar, whom he calls his father and who may have been his father. It's a tangled web of empires and who married who and who was a child adopted by whom. We can go into that some other time. And it is just blind pride. Look at verse 30 of chapter 5. That same night... Belshazzar the Chaldean was slain. 539 BC, the Babylonian Empire comes to an end. Really a tragic story. How do the faithful saints appreciate the sovereignty of God? Well, in the fire, in chapter 3, verse 17 and 18, they said, we're not going to bow down to your statue. God may deliver us, and if he doesn't, we're not going to worship you. Remarkable faith in the sovereignty of God before the terror of a pagan king. Nebuchadnezzar had to be humbled. Belshazzar had to be humbled. One in repentance, one in death. All of it points to God's sovereignty to manifest his rule. We need to think about the suffering of God's people, the suffering of the saints, those who loved God, feared God, 
they don't get a get out of persecution free card just for their loyalty to God. I don't know if you've ever felt the unfairness of suffering in your loyalty to Christ. Right? This is the dilemma of Psalm 37, Psalm 73. It seems like the wicked get everything they, they always want, and, and I'm trying so hard to be faithful to Christ, and things just aren't going my way. Listen, that's the norm. Uh, for Daniel and for his three friends, they suffered. Uh, they suffered unjustly, unfairly. Uh, they suffered the way their Savior would one day. And in their suffering, they experienced God's personal presence. Do you remember in the, in the fiery furnace? I have a photograph of it uh, up here for you. There they are. Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah. And a, a fourth being, one like the son of the gods. I believe that is the pre-incarnate Christ. And he's there with them. He's, he's there to give assurance. He's with them in the fire and in their suffering. And in this case, preserves their lives to bring glory to his own name. Uh, the next photograph, again, they're not really photographs, but there's Daniel. And God shut the mouths of the lions. And the lions were hungry. You remember the scene. When, when the other guys were tossed in, the lions devoured them instantaneously. But God was personally present with his people in their suffering. He's keeping his promises. He's faithful to his covenants, and, and the preservation of the three in the fiery furnace and of Daniel in the den of lions was an emblem to the entire nation that even in Babylonian captivity, in the heart of the evil empire, and whatever empires would come forward, God would keep a remnant. God would keep his people. The effect of the faithful on others we see in Daniel chapter 6. Look at verse 16. The king gave orders, Daniel was brought in and cast into the lion's den. The king spoke and said to Daniel, Your God whom you constantly serve may himself deliver you. This is on the lips of a pagan king who had seen Daniel's life and faith and placed faith in the God of Daniel to preserve. For his own vanity and through flattery, he had been snookered by manipulators into throwing his best administrator into the den of lions. And then he fasted all night, hoping that Daniel would be rescued by his God. Here, here the pagan king is hoping in the God of Israel. Look at verse 18. The king went off to his palace, spent the night fasting, and no entertainment was brought before him, and his sleep fled from him. At the break of day, he went in haste to find out that Daniel was okay. Think about the effect of this persecution, the suffering of God's people on Daniel himself. Turn to Daniel chapter 9. We have there this prayer, this lengthy prayer from Daniel for the nation. And it's a confession of sin. It's a confession of their rebellion. It's a confession of God's rightness. Look at verse 19. He says, O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, listen and take action for your own sake, O my God. Do not delay, because your city and your people are called by your name. What is Daniel appealing to? Not the merit of the nation to be forgiven and restored, but the glory of God identified with his name, which is in keeping with his character, which is manifest in his covenant promises. God, be faithful to yourself, Daniel prays. Your people and your name are called by you. Please answer our prayer. How does God answer the prayer? Daniel gets a visitor from an angel in verse 20, and then this declaration, staggering declaration in verses 24 to 27. Here, here's the answer from God to Daniel's prayer about God's glory through his name and his covenant promises to his people. Seventy sevens have been decreed for your people, for your holy city, to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, to anoint the most holy place. A six-fold promise as an answer to Daniel's prayer. The six-fold promise is staggering. It comes in 70 sevens or 70 groups of seven things. Uh, sevens is a word that's used for Sabbaths. 
here, we're talking about sevens of years, 70 sevens of years, or 490 years. This is for your people and your city. Who are the 490 years for? For Israel, a people in a place. And the sixfold purpose from God in this prophetic section is to finish transgression. That means uh, to bring an end to the deliberately crossing the line in God's people. To make an end of sin, that is to complete it, to seal it up, to bring it to its completion. Uh, Number three, to make atonement for iniquity. In other words, God is going to bring about actual forgiveness for the sins of His people. Number four, to bring in everlasting righteousness. That is to bring in Israel's Messiah. And you can't think just about His first coming, but also His second coming. Number five, to seal up vision and prophecy, to complete it. Number six, to anoint the most holy place. And in all the possible uh, references of this most holy place anointing, all the tabernacles, temples, dwelling places that could possibly be referenced here, only one fits the prophecy, and that is the temple in a coming kingdom on the earth. It is Ezekiel's millennial temple that we looked at last week in chapters 40 to 48 of Ezekiel. It's the only one that fits this prophecy. What Daniel describes here is God's unfolding purpose for the nation of Israel. Despite what the world looks like, God's going to keep his promises. Verse 25 of this prophecy describes the time before Messiah. Those 77s or 490 years are divided up into 7 plus 62 plus 1. 7 plus 62 is the first 69 and then a gap in time and then the last 7 or the last 7 years. Really staggering. Verse 25 describes the 62 plus 7, or the first 69 sevens, 483 years. And then verse 27 gives us the last seven, or the last seven years. From our vantage point, those first 69 have already taken place. In fact, you can put a date on these things. Uh, The description is from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. There were three decrees from the Persian Empire. Only one of them fits. It is Artaxerxes' decree to rebuild the city, described in Nehemiah 1, Nehemiah 2. We actually have the exact date for that at 444 B.C., the 20th year of Artaxerxes in the month of Nisan. That is March 14th, 444 B.C., where the clock starts. And the clock starts for a countdown of 483 years to the time when Messiah the Prince would come. This is a staggeringly detailed, precise, accurate prediction in your Bible. It's one of those things that just gives us a a, a radical view of what this book is that we're looking at. This is none other than God's Word, the the author of history, the one who can tell the future because he's in the future, he knows the future, he wrote the future already. And you can pin this 483 years, and it takes a little bit of work to understand that a prophetic year was 360 days, not 365 and a quarter. Technically, our days are are 365.24219879 days. And we account for leap years, you know, uh, every four years we adjust a little bit, but I don't know if you knew this, um, century years are not considered leap years unless they're divisible by 400. Okay, so the year 1700, 1800, and 1900 were not leap years. I don't know if you've ever worked all of that out. But when you work all of that out and you, and you think of a prophetic year as 360 years, this puts the end of the 483 prophetic years at March 30th, A.D. 33, which I believe puts us right at the fulfillment of Zechariah 9.9, when the king would come riding on a colt into Jerusalem, the fulfillment of Psalm 118.26 and depicted in Luke 19 where Jesus is telling a parable about an exacting king. It, it, the, the, the king who's demanding things that just seem unreasonable. But it really is a parable of Israel's failed stewardship of God's truth and promises. And the end of that parable in verse 27 of Luke 19, the parable goes like this. The subjects did not want their king to reign. And all of a sudden, the parable is not so much a story, but the reality of Israel's rejection of her Messiah in his first coming. They rejected the messianic kingdom. 
Prior to this moment, Jesus had told the people not to reveal who he was. Now he comes into Jerusalem at the triumphal entry, and the people are crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And Zechariah 9.9 is being fulfilled in this moment. The crowd even says, this is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. And Jesus wept. He is saying, if only. And then he goes on to say, uh, if only you had known the time of your visitation. The king came and you rejected him. This is Daniel 9, 26 fulfilled. fulfilled. 483 years to the day from the issuing of the decree by Artaxerxes in 444 BC, you have Messiah the Prince come. And look down at Daniel chapter 9. After the 62 weeks, Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. What does that mean? Messiah got cut off. Killed, and no kingdom. Listen, the kingdom didn't start when Jesus came the first time. He doesn't have anything. The kingdom that Daniel described in chapter two and in chapter seven is a kingdom that will fill the whole earth and be a reign of righteousness under Messiah. It hasn't happened yet. Messiah was actually cut off, left with nothing. And then the city and the sanctuary would be destroyed, according to verse 26. And notice in verse 26, who destroys Jerusalem and the temple? We look back in history, we go, well, A.D. 70, Titus Vespasian. And notice how Daniel describes it so many years earlier. The people of the prince who is to come. He's already been talking about this prince who is to come. And I know I'm over time. I, this was just the danger. I'm so sorry. Stick with me for a few minutes and we'll wrap this up. Daniel has told us about the Antichrist. Uh, the, the henchman, the dark lord of a revived Roman Empire. What's interesting, it is the Roman Empire, first version, that crucified Messiah and cut him off, destroyed the temple, destroyed the city. They are the people of the prince who is to come. Well, the Roman Empire has since gone off the scene. The prince who is to come hasn't come yet. There is a revived Roman Empire coming. We are in the gap between these things. And then there will be desolations. And he, the prince who is to come, of that same people who killed Messiah, in other words, the Roman Empire revived. This is the, the mixed uh, materials part of the statue at the bottom of, of the vision in Daniel 2. It's the really scary beast in Daniel's beast vision in chapter 7. This revived Roman Empire and the leader of it, the Antichrist, will make a firm covenant with the many for one week. What do we learn here is a week, a seven. Literally, the Hebrew word is a seven. He'll, he'll make a covenant for one seven. But in the middle of that seven, he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering and on the wing of abominations, the abomination which makes desolate, even a complete destruction, one that is decreed, decreed will be poured out. We have here the future history of the world. At some point in the future, and, and the first coming of Messiah, you could pin down to 483 years from a decree by Artaxerxes. The second coming of Messiah is unknowable. Anybody who tells you they know when it's going to happen or they know who the Antichrist is, run away. <laughs> it's a violation. We don't have a time stamp on this event. But once the clock starts ticking of that last seven, then you have a countdown. Three and a half years to the abomination of desolation. In Matthew 24, Jesus said, when you see that happen, flee Jerusalem. There will be people who will read Daniel, who will read Jesus' words in Matthew, and they will follow the instructions. That is the period of the great tribulation. It's the period of Israel's pruning of the nation's judgments, the very things we'll be talking about in Revelation 6 through 18 on Sunday mornings. All of that predicted here by Daniel. It's staggering when you just look at Daniel chapter 11, and we won't go through this. This is the remarkable history of Israel in the nations in between Old Testament and New Testament. And it's so staggeringly accurate from uh, Antiochus Epiphanes and Alexander the Great and Cleopatra. These names we know from Greek history, they're all right here in Daniel. In fact, we have in chapter 11, up through verse 34, 135 specific biblical prophecies fulfilled 
before Christ came. And we can read the history books, match it up to Daniel 11, and go, yep, 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 that's exactly what happened. And from verse 35 on, we have these unfulfilled prophecies. What does that tell us about the book of Daniel? Those future predictions should be taken literally and at face value. They describe real people, real empires, real events, real chronologies. And that tells us something about our Bible. That this is God's word, the sovereign God of history in charge of all things. He is bringing all of history to his intended end. Well, I don't know what else to say about Daniel. We just have to stop. It's a good book. You should read it the rest of your life. You should believe it. The highlight of the book of Daniel is the person of Christ. Messiah himself in chapter 7 is the one who goes up to the Ancient of Days, receives the right to the kingdom, and he is the one who will come down on the earth whose kingdom will last forever. I want to read to you the the last verse of the book of Daniel. And I want to read this verse to you because I had read the book of Daniel many times in my life and I I was drawn to the end, the last vision of Daniel, chapters 10 to 12, many times. And I would always get sort of bogged down in verses 11 and 12 of Daniel 12. Daniel 12 tells us about the final resurrection, the judgment of the wicked and the righteous. It's a continuation of this last vision of the Antichrist, but then Messiah coming. I believe Jesus, pre-incarnate Christ, speaks to Daniel in verses 6 and 7 personally. Even answers how, how much time will be left after the abomination of desolation. He says three and a half years. And then in verses 11 and 12, you say, from, that, from the time that the regular sacrifice is abolished and the abomination of desolation is set up, there will be 1,290 days. That's... 30 extra days besides the three and a half years? And then how blessed is he who keeps waiting and attains to the 1,335 days? That's an extra 45 days on top of that. So you have 75 extra days after the return of Messiah on the earth. And I always, man, what's going on in those 75 days? We've got scorched earth. It's got to be cleaned up. The saints will have to be setting up their administrative deals. Jesus is going to be handing out responsibilities. Sheep and goats judgment will happen during that time. Filling in the rest of the biblical data for what happens in those extra 75 days. 75 days, 75 days. I think I just always got bogged down there, and then I would just close my Bible. And then when we were going through Daniel verse by verse, I had to say something about the last verse, and it slowed me down. And I just want to read it to you. Look, in fact, look down at your Bibles. Th- this verse was in my Bible the whole time. It was lurking there. <laughs> and I want you to see it. Verse 13. But as for you, this is Jesus, pre-incarnate Christ, speaking to Daniel. Go your way to the end. Literally, go to your end, Daniel. Then you will enter into rest, and then you will rise again, for your allotment, your allotted portion at the end of the age. There are so many details in this verse. Here, Jesus is assuring Daniel of his personal salvation. You belong to me, Daniel. And no, you're not. I know Jeremiah promised 70 years. You're not going back to the land with the returnees. In fact, Daniel ended up in Persia, lived out the rest of his life in another foreign land. Daniel, you just... Live your life that I have for you. You go to your end. He says, Daniel, go and die. Then you will rest. You will have rest when you die. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. Then you will rise again. Here is a a promise to an Old Testament saint about bodily resurrection, right? Sometimes we think the Old Testament wasn't clear about resurrection. Daniel was clear. Daniel 12, 1 and 2. There's a bodily resurrection coming and a personal promise from the pre-incarnate Christ to Daniel that he will experience physical resurrection. When? Well, after he dies, after he rests for a while, and then the rising again is tied to the last phrase, at the end of the age. Which age has he been talking about? This age at the end of the great tribulation and the return of Christ. In other words, an Old Testament saint resurrection placed right at the beginning of Messiah's kingdom on the earth. And notice the promise, you will rise again unto what, Daniel? Unto your allotted portion. 
one word there in the Hebrew. It is the word used 25 times in the book of Joshua to describe the allotment of land for Jews in Palestine, in the promised land where God divided the the parcels up by by family and clan and tribe. So God has been making promises, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and their descendants for a land, for descendants, for blessing, for a Messiah. Listen, God keeps his promises. Abraham will walk in the land that God promised him. Isaac will walk in the land that God promised. Moses will actually get to walk in the land that he only got to look at before God took him home. The Old Testament saints, including Daniel, will rise physically, bodily, by the promise of Messiah himself to their allotted portion. Listen, this is no mere carnal promise. Oh, what what is this deal about land on the earth? Isn't that so earthly and carnal? No, this is God keeping his promises and keeping his word for a glorious future for his people, the people he promised it to. And what do we do with all of that? God's in charge of history. God keeps his promises. You need fear no tyrant, no administration, no empire, no geopolitics, no hard circumstance, no den of lions, no fiery furnace, if God is with you. He's in charge of history, and you can trust him. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. There's nothing like it. Thank you for this prophet, the book of Daniel, who teaches us what it's like to be faithful as a young man, what it's like to be faithful as an old man what it's like to cling to your word. Thank you that through this prophet, you have told us what the future is. We need not worry that the universe is some cosmic display of yin yang, uh, equal forces, and we don't know what the outcome is gonna be. No, you are the sovereign God of history. You are in charge. And you will establish on the throne, on this earth, your Messiah, the same one who came 2,000 years ago and was cut off to pay for sin. We thank you that all who trust in him will reign with him. May we trust you all of our days. It's in his name we pray, amen.